Uh, welcome, everyone. We're really excited today. Um, uh, happy to see everyone. I know it's been a difficult time over the last few months, so it's always great to kind of see everyone together again uh, on a monthly basis, and we just get to share ideas and, and talk about real estate, which is awesome. So today, I'm thrilled to have Brian Hennessy. Uh, I personally have read both his books on commercial real estate. He also has another book uh, for residential agents that want to learn how to uh, transact in the commercial market as well. Uh, he's a 30 year experience in the commercial real estate industry, successfully conducted over 9 million square feet of property transactions. Uh, he's ta he talks at various different conferences and webinars and all these different uh, speaking events, talking about commercial real estate, the due diligence process, how to add value to commercial real estate. So really is gonna have a ton of great information. I'm just really excited to have them. And I guess, Brian, you wanna take it away? Yes, thank you very much, Raphael. I appreciate the invitation to come on. It's it's a subject I'm pretty passionate about. So uh, I would love to be able to teach you everything I know about due diligence in this short period of time. But I, I promise you that uh, the time that you spend on the webinar today will be time well spent because I'll give you some valuable tools to uh, take with you to use in your own investing or if you help others to invest. Um, that you'll be able to put in your toolkit and, and start using right away. So with that, um, I'll give you a little bit of context um, about how I got in the business and what have you. Um, let's see if I can go to this. Uh, as Raphael mentioned, I've been in the business a long time as evidenced by all the gray hairs here. But, um, the business has changed dramatically and uh, we were um, talking earlier before we went on here um, the, in the last few months it is <laughs> really uh, morphing into something else which uh, I've been through a number of these cycles but this one uh, is the magnitude and the scope of this one is so, so much greater than the other ones that I just think that uh, if anything, uh, the due diligence process is going to be even more important than it ever was. And it always was important. But those, those who aren't uh, real familiar with it uh, will want to be very familiar with it uh, going forward. So they can make informed and intelligent decisions if they're out there investing their money. So, but anyway, to get uh, back to a little bit of context under which how I uh, uh, became involved in, in due diligence, uh, what happened was after being a uh, broker for 18 years, uh, one of my clients decided that he wanted to start a real estate investment firm. And he asked me to come aboard as his uh, vice president of acquisitions and dispositions. And I told him I, I'd help him in any way I could, but he just didn't buy enough properties. And so about a year went by and um, he had, we had spoken a couple of times um, during the year, but nothing that I, he was more looking for property than anything. But then he called me one night, it was in a December, late in December and uh, he said, hey, you know, I, I'm, what are you going to be doing this coming year? And I said, well, I'm doing what I've been doing. I've been to be a broker. And he goes, well, I'd like to talk to you about coming over to work with me. And I said, look, I told you before, you just don't buy enough property, but I'll, I'll, I'll help you as much as I can. He says, no, I, I, I bought a lot of property. And I said, like, well, how much? And he said, uh, about 500,000 square feet. I said, well, you didn't buy that around here. And he says, no, all over the country. And uh, I said, well, what are you doing? And he says, well, I just get going to where there's more bang for your buck. And I just, it's not around here. He says, but I want you to come in and talk to me and I'll tell you all about what I'm doing. So I went in and I spoke with him and uh, he showed me what he was up to and what he wanted, where he wanted to go to. And he had some pretty grandiose ideas, and I figured, you know what, this guy's a pretty sharp guy. He was a uh, CEO turnaround guy. And I thought if anybody could do it, 
probably be him. So I decided, I said, well, let me speak with my wife about this. And I'll, you know, I'll get back to you. So when I went to speak to my wife about it, she said, do you really think he's going to buy all that property? And I said, well, look, I, you know, he's certainly hell bent to give it a try and, and he's been doing pretty well. So yeah, I think he could. And she said, well, then why don't you just give it a try with him and see how it goes. So, so that's what I did. And we ended up really on a, uh, a whirlwind ride of from early uh, 2003 I left there in uh, the end of 06 and we bought uh, a little over 8 million square feet at that point and then I broke off from there and I started my own syndication company but it was a crazy uh, ride because with just a small little group of, of us that were doing this um, we had to do a lot of due diligence and the first couple of transactions I did with them were really that uh, showed me that being a broker and being an acquisition per person was two very different roles and we were buying two very large office properties in uh, Dallas and the we're buying them from a Canadian investment firm and the vice president of the firm that I was dealing with surmised quite quickly that I was new to being a buyer of uh, large office properties and quickly took me to school. And it was a very, very uh, stressful scenario because first of all, he didn't have an office for me to sit in when I went to work for him. So I was sitting in this big 7,000 square foot space and I, by myself, and I had uh, all these legal pads in front of me writing down all the questions I need to ask of who and what. And um, the heat just kept getting turned up as the due diligence clock was ticking. And as towards the end, I had a bunch of people asking me a bunch of questions and trying to get answers to. And I just, I couldn't wait for the escrows to close. And then about two weeks after I went into his office and he, uh, or actually two weeks, I went into the office and one of the gals there said, hey, you know, he wants to talk to you. I said, okay, so uh, I went into his office, he said, have a seat. And um, I sat down, he got up and he closed the door behind him and then he said, uh, I just want to know, uh, you know, how you missed all that information uh, on the two transactions we just closed on. And I was it's like, I don't know, I don't know what specifically are you talking about? And he went through a list of things and, you know, I was like, I was like, wow, well, I didn't know that. And I wasn't aware of that. And I probably should have asked that question. I'm sorry. But, you know, and then he said, I think I made a huge mistake hiring you as my uh, acquisition person just because you were a broker for 18 years. And it was a uh, tough pill to swallow because I was thinking, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe I, you know, maybe he shouldn't have. But, you know, when I went home that night, I was tossing and turning and thinking, okay, what am I going to do? Because I shouldn't have missed all that information. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself a, uh, a manual. And in it, I'm going to write all the questions I need to ask and all the uh, uh, checklists and issues I needed to uh, know about. And uh, what I did is I just kept this manual going. And... Uh, kept adding to it. Every time I learned a new lesson, I would put the information in there. And what happened is I eventually um, used it as the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate. Because when I went back to being a broker, uh, I really didn't know how to differentiate myself. Uh, so I decided, well, maybe I'll take my um, reference manual and create a handbook out of it. And I really was just a marketing tool. I never, ever thought it would ever sell a copy. I just wanted to say I had a handbook up on uh, Amazon. <laughs> and what happened was it sold a few copies. I was like, wow, maybe some friends or family bought it or something. And then when it sold more, I was like, wow, I don't have that many friends or family I would buy that book. So I decided to... Uh, take it a little more seriously when I saw it was selling more copies and uh, I, I, I had a because I wouldn't even have a copy I mean a, uh, a cover made I didn't want to spend the 150 bucks 
because I knew it was never going to sell any. So why waste my money on it? But when I saw it was selling, I decided to get a professional copy done. And then I got some reviews and I added some stories into it to make it a little more personable. And when I put it back up on Amazon, it took off and it ended up be, being a number one bestseller a number of times on there, which still blows my mind. It's still one of, one of the bestseller uh, commercial books up there. And I think the reason for that is because nobody was addressing the due diligence issue. It was, um, like I said, after being a broker for 18 years, I didn't know what I didn't know. I really didn't. And um, so to me, it's very gratifying to teach this to people and uh, hear from, you know, different people uh, through their emails and their calls and what have you about how much it's really helped them during their uh, investing process. And uh, to me, that's very gratifying. So with that, we're going to move on and learn a little bit about this stuff here. But um, here's kind of a highlight of the reasons we, you really, these are some of the things we're going to hit on uh, during the talk here, but, you know, some of the, which are going to be uh, do during the negotiated negotiation of the purchase sale agreement and the, once the agreement's signed. And some critical issues you want to go through, energy savings, mechanical, physical inspection, some reviewing in the books and records, underwriting and financials, and the appraisal and closing process. So with that, I'm going to start out with uh, during the negotiations of purchase and sale agreement, and once you get it signed, you want to ask to review all the tenant files and correspondence. Now, I find that a lot of uh, investors will not think about this or, or even uh, want to do it. But I tell them, look, there's a, there's a gold mine of information in these tenant correspondence files. If you're going to the property managers, obviously it's for leased investments. But if you're going to the property manager's office or the seller's offering them up, uh, you go to their office or whatever the case may be. But if you go through those files, what you're going to find is uh, there's correspondence in there, complaint letters, um, uh, repair uh, notices and things like that, requests for repairs. And what happens is the most vociferous of the tenants are the ones that are going to be putting in all the information that are going to have that. And I've gotten some really, really valuable information just by digging through these files. I'll make notes and say, okay, I got to make sure that I really speak to this tenant because they seem to have a ton of information in there. And I'm sure that once I speak to them, they're going to tell me a lot. And it's very rarely I've ever, has that ever failed me. So you want to review all the leases and what you're doing is you want to make note of any outstanding issues that are in there. Uh, for example, any can cancellation or termination provisions, because let's say it's a five year lease and they get to cancel after two years or three years, guess what? The lender is only going to count it as that. They're not going to count it past the, termination provision. Uh, if they have a contraction provision, let's say they're in 5,000 feet and they get to contract down to 3,000 or 2,000 feet, same, same situation. You want to know, you, the, you know, these are things that I'm making note of saying, I'm going to talk to them and see how business is going when I do these tenant interviews, which we'll talk about. And any other issues of impact the Viet value of the lease. Now, the reason I say that is because what you want to negotiate in the lease is anything that has been agreed to in the lease prior to the end of your due diligence period, you want to get a credit for. For example, if they uh, have any free rent coming up, you want to make sure you get a credit for that. If they have tenant improvement allowances that are refurbishment allowances, uh, you want to get a credit for that. Anything owed to the credit by the landlord, you want to get a credit for in the future. Anything past your due diligence period, uh, once your money becomes unrefundable, then that's on your dime. And so if they're doing leases after that, then if you incur tenant improvement dollars and 
commissions, et cetera, then you're willing to pay for it. Obviously you'll want to approve it, but um, I'll give you a couple of brief little examples of those. One was um, a building we were buying in Phoenix and it was owned by a lender and they flew their attorney out to negotiate the uh, contract with us. And I insisted upon having that in there that any costs prior to the end of our due diligence is there on their dime. So when we were closing and we got the, uh, you know, uh, settlement statement, we we're looking at it and I said, wait a second, there, there's a, a big number in here for tenant improvements and, and free rent and, and uh, real estate commissions. That's not, that's not ours. That's yours. And he goes, no, no, these are leases that we've just finished. And, and I go, it doesn't matter. It wasn't, it was done before the end of our due diligence period. You're going to, it's, it's, it's on your dime. Look at, you know, paragraph nine, little a, little <laughs> I or whatever. Right. And he goes, let me call you back. So half hour later, he calls me back. He says, you're right. I don't know why we would ever have agreed to that. It was 450 grand. It's a big number. Right. So uh, another time I was buying a, a property in, uh, outside of Orlando and uh sprint had a full floor in there and they had just renewed their lease uh recently and i was reading through their lease and i saw that they had a refurbishment allowance of a hundred thousand dollars that they could use so i called up the property manager and i said uh did sprint uh use their refurbishment allowance yet for the hundred grand they go no not yet they haven't asked for it and i said well we're going to be getting a credit for that, you know, at the close of escrow. She said, well, if they don't exercise in the next, they had another three weeks or something like that left. They don't exercise, then we'll give you a credit. Well, they didn't exercise, so they forfeited their hundred grand. But if they wouldn't have forfeited their hundred grand and I had closed, then I would have been giving them the hundred grand. So these are examples of why you want to scrutinize very carefully what those are. Uh, mechanical systems. Now, depending upon the type of property uh, you want to, uh, you're, you're looking to buy, some of them obviously are going to be more uh, involved, i.e. like the uh, office properties where you got elevators and uh, HVAC systems, etc. So you want to find out quickly, you know, what, what are the deal breakers in these? If there's, if, if the HVAC unit is a chilled water system and it's a, it's a big, you know, system, then you're talking a lot of money if you have to replace that, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, there's, if that, if that's going to be a big number, if you're not going to get a credit, then or work something out with them, then you want to. You may decide you're you're going to blow out of the deal. Same with the elevators. Same with other other big number, big ticket items for uh, physical and mechanical issues. Now I, I touched on this a little bit, but to me, conducting tenant interviews is the single most. Uh, important source of information that you're going to get in a leased investment. Now you're going to get pushback on this from uh, sellers a lot of times. They'll say, no, 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 no. You're not talking to my tenants. I don't want them knowing that uh, we're selling the building until your money's hard. Right? It's like, well, wait a second. I'm not buying the building unless I can talk to the tenants. Okay. Because uh, I want to know what's if there's any issues there. I want to know what's going on. You, what are you trying to hide? Well, I'm not trying to hide anything. All right. Well, if you're not trying to hide anything, then it shouldn't be a problem with us uh, talking with your tenants. Then at that point, a lot of times you'll end up negotiating which tenants you're going to be talking to. Now, obviously, you want to talk to the bigger ones, the ones that are coming up for renewal in the next 12 to 18 months. Any ones that you had seen in, if, you, if you've already gone through the tenant correspondence at have major issues in there, have had issues in the past. But I will tell you that um, once you uh, start interviewing tenants, you will agree with me that 
it is the best source of information because many times the tenants that are in the property they've been there longer than the people that own it they know more about that building than the owners do and i've had sellers tell me how do you know all this stuff i didn't even know this stuff and i'd say because i interviewed the tenants you probably didn't ask them the questions that i did right but uh, I've actually passed on deals because of information that I found out about from the tenant interview. So you don't want to uh, pass on this opportunity. And if they push back really hard on, to, on you and say, no, absolutely not, I would look at that as a red flag and say, they're hiding something. Because I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that bought properties that said, well, I asked and they said no, so I bought it. and then the you know 20,000 foot tenant in there went bankrupt six months later. Yeah, they didn't want you to find that out, right? Because if you were talking to them, they probably would have told you they're in financial trouble or you would have gone in and saw, you know, eight people sitting in a huge square footage and you, that creates red flags right there, right? Hey, what's going on? How come you guys are, doesn't look like you're using much of the space? Well, we're in financial, you know, straps here right now. And, I don't know if we're going to make it. Well, okay, well, now you know. You're not probably going to would take them off your, uh, you know, put them in as, as a, a potential vacancy coming up, right? Uh, uh, so these are the things you want to find out during your, your tenant interviews. Here's one that I, I really, really stress to people that you want to uh, make sure you do, and that's spend time at the property. You know, what I typically will hear is, well, I do, I, when the inspectors are there, I go there and I, and I go, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you want to go there at different times of the day, different days. You want to go there the first thing in the morning. You want to go there, you know, noon, evenings, weekends. You want to see how this property operates. And depending upon the type of property, it's going to tell you a lot because you're going to, you're going to find out about the tenants. They're coming and going. Let's say for instance, it's an apartment building. Well, if you're there and all the cars are parked in there, well, you're going to see what kind of cars are being parked in there, right? If you go there on a weekend or evening or whatever, you might see people hanging out in front that wouldn't be there in the morning or midday, right? It's going to give you a pretty good indication of how the property operates. If it's a if it's a retail building, you'll see how the parking works. Is it overparked? Is there too many cars in there? If it's an office building, or is the uh, are there vagrants? If it's in the city area, uh, coming in and using the facilities the first thing in the morning, uh, are there uh, people, teenagers or something, hanging out in the parking lot on the weekends? It's a good party spot right there. There's a bunch of stuff you can find out about it by going there at different times. So you want to go there and find out what's going on in the different times. And you'll be amazed. You will. Uh, interview the vendors and the contractors. Now, remember I was telling you going through the correspondence files, the tenants correspondence files? Take note of any, uh, if there's any invoices in there, like if there was an air conditioning uh, vendor that was in there, get their contact information, anybody else that was working in there, ask the property manager, ask the uh, seller, hey, do you have any invoices of, of things that you've had repaired here? Why do you want to do that? Because when you call these vendors and contractors, there are a wealth of information. I, you know, I would, I would call up and say, hey, we're in escrow, we're buying this property right now, and uh, I was wondering, uh, could you shed any light on the on the HVAC units, or you know what kind of condition? And you'd be surprised if they if they're looking at at you as a future customer. A lot of them will tell you all sorts of things, like, oh yeah, there's you know more than half of those units up there. They're just barely working. I'm constantly up there putting more Freon in there, and they they need to replace those. I I just keep milking those things, and but you know, you're gonna probably replace at least half of them in the next couple of three years. And it's like, whoa, you know, or eight, or the elevator uh, maintenance person, like, you know, no, these things are, this, this thing is in constant need of help. You, you're gonna need to um, 
do some work for these things to keep them to keep them going roof maintenance obviously you have physical inspections when you're doing this but when you're talking to the guys that have been working on it for years you're going to get the real story you know so don't pass that opportunity up because uh, they can really give you some valuable information Here's one that I, I really like to uh, stress and emphasize, and I can't overemphasize it, is when you are doing your due diligence, you wanna make sure that you are documenting all the communications, okay? Which I, what I mean by that is even if you have a, um, a phone call with the broker, the seller, the property manager, whatever the case may be, as soon as you get off the phone, you want to document in an email to that person, right? As our, as per our telephone discussion, you will be getting me the backup information uh, for the um, tenant release, you know, uh, lien release forms on that suite that we discussed, and cancel checks to the contractor and the brokerage commissions, etc. Right. Why do you do this? Because you've got so many things that you are following up on and, and looking for that it's hard to keep track of them, even if you're writing them down. And not only that, you want to, I would always CC whoever my team members were, whether that be the real estate attorney, the people, the, the accountant, whoever was working on my team, I put them on that, that needed to know about this because you have more people that are on top of it. And then a few days, you know, four or five days before the due diligence period is up, you're scanning all your emails. Oh yeah, I never got that information, you know, so I put a call in. Hey, I never got the cancel checks on that or lien releases. If we don't get that, we're assuming we're, we're gonna be getting a credit on that. Well, not so fast, I, we're, this is what happened. You know, we still have a dispute with the contractor or the tenant or whatever. And then I'd say, okay, that's got to be resolved. Before we close, that has to be resolved. A lot of times they'll resolve it. Sometimes they don't and you get a credit. But let me tell you something. If you're not asking about it and you're not aware about it and it slips through the cracks, good luck trying to get them to respond to it. And it's a lot tougher. So make sure you develop that tracking system. Once you make it a habit, it's easy but um, it's gonna save you a lot of uh, headaches and heartache. You know, it, it, I tell people at the, at the very least, even if it slips through the cracks, at least you've got email showing you tried to get that from them. If you gotta go to, into a court of law, you can say, your honor, I asked in two or three different emails, you know, and they never got, a, got back to me on it. Oh, really? Okay, well, it shows that you made a, you know, an attempt, but they were unwilling to provide, right? Now, here's one. Oh, I, I, I wanted to share a little story <laughs> about to emphasize about interviewing the vendors, too. Let's go back to that so we know we're talking about. Did I, I forgot that story. I, I forgot to tell that story. I'm going to tell it real quick. I, we were buying a hotel. And uh, it was a pretty large hotel. It was uh, 377 rooms from a very uh, well-known hotelier, international hotelier. If I mentioned her name, you would recognize it immediately. And uh, I told them that we wanted to go walk all the hotel suites. And they said, absolutely not. It's way too disruptive to our guests. We're not gonna do that. Well, I was, I'd never bought a hotel before. So here I am, I'm interviewing the vendors and everything. And, and one of the vendors I was talking to said, you know, there's a lot of rooms out of service here due to mold issues. And I said, no, I didn't know that. And you know how many hotel rooms are out? And he goes, no, we don't. But I, I know there's a lot of them. I said, well, thanks for sharing that. So I immediately called the person that I was negotiating the deal with. And I said, listen, I just heard that you have a bunch of rooms out of service in the hotel. And if we don't get to walk each and every one of those suites, I'm canceling escrow tomorrow. And he said, okay, fine. So we ended up walking all the suites and we found out there was 55 rooms that were out of service due to mold issues. 
when I was walking in those rooms, I will tell you there, there were some that I was afraid to walk into because there was black fuzzy stuff on the walls from the mold. So had I, people have told me, oh, you would have got your money if you had to go, maybe, maybe not. I, my guess is it probably would have been years later. Who knows what we would have settled for. But since they knew it was an issue, we got two and a half million dollars. Right? And we didn't cost us two and a half million dollars to fix it. So, but don't, don't let them talk you out of not walking all the, the this, whether it's the suites, if it's apartments, if it's uh, retail units, industrial units, I don't, I don't care what it is. You want to walk them. You're going to find out a lot of information when you do that. How many tenants, how many people are in the space, what kind of condition it's in. Let's say it's an apartment building. Okay, well, if there's a lot of apartments there and there's, let's say, 50 plus units or 100 units and you're walking them and, and they will, don't want to show you a couple of them, well, you know, I, this has happened to me where I walked in and I found out, I said, no, I want to see the vacancies too. I want to see everything. And we walked in and one of them was, had smoke damage and a bunch of the appliances were taken out and doors were taken off and it probably would have cost fifty, sixty thousand dollars to put the thing back into shape again, you know. The other one had mold issues, water damage and stuff. So those are two units in, in a complex that were just out of service that they didn't fix, right? So that's why you want to go through them and check them out. Um, when they don't, when they're when they're really adamant about it, usually it's I, I would consider that a red flag. It's like, no, there's something going on here. I just don't get a good feeling about it. So um, be adamant about these things because I, I understand if you're buying, you know, 12 units or 15 units or something and they don't want, you know, they don't want to have you walk each and every one because somebody's in there. But even then I would say, hey, if it's me, I've just seen too many crazy stories to just slip it off as just a, you know, inconvenience to them. That's just the way I feel about it. So here's one that uh, I always call a cheap insurance, the building measurement verification. Let's say you're, you're buying a little building and um, the seller says, oh, it's, you know, 8,422 square feet. Okay. Um, well, do you have any building plans or anything that you, 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 should, you know, give us? No, we don't. Just go have them measured, okay? To have the thing measured. Have somebody out in the field measure it. Um, the bigger the buildings are, especially office building, buildings. Office buildings are always fluctuating in uh, square footage because it has to do with, uh, in the markets sometimes, they'll artificially deflate the add-on factor or inflate it if it's doing better. Um, you know, it's also the BOMA standards, BOMA standard verification has changed over time. Sometimes you can pick up some additional square footage from that. So uh, it's well worth um, spending the money just to have somebody come out and field measure in, especially if they're going to give you the, uh, the BOMA standard uh, measurement guide that, it's a, that it comes with that shows all the measurements. Because then when you go to sell it, you just hand it to the new buyer and say, look, we had it measured BOMA standard, here's the book, that issue goes away. But um, at the very least, look at the building plans and see if it correlates to what they're telling you. Where this became pretty popular now is building measurement is when these people buy these McMansions, you know, and they're saying they're buying a, you know, oh yeah, this is a 15,000 square foot home that you're buying here and then they measure it and they find out it's 12,000 feet right so very important if you're buying a, a commercial property though it's really not that much money to do it and you can be assured of what the square footage is energy audits i always tell people just do one it's it's in, in california you have to do it if your building's over uh, 20,000 feet i think it is and um, 
you want to find out what are the issues because the, the fact of the matter is is the the equipment and some of these other energy uh, conservation measures that have been taken have been all upgraded and it's really saves you a lot of money on the bottom line and if you can tell your tenants hey i've just replaced this that or these units or whatever then it's it's something that uh is a selling point as well but uh you'd be surprised how much can go to the bottom line especially if you or the landlord are picking up some of those utilities now back to the physical inspection part the, the curtain walls if you're buying uh let's say an R and D building or a retail or uh, office property, ask about, you know, how are the curtain walls? You can see when you're walking around, if you see uh, the, the seals start shrinking and they're peeling down from, hanging down from the sides of the window. When you're doing your tenant interviews, you should ask the tenants, hey, do you have any window leakage problems? You know, here in California, it doesn't rain very much, so it's not that big an issue because people even forget to ask, but, you know, I always ask that pro that question. And you'd be surprised, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've, every rainy season, we get, you know, problems with the leaking in here. So find out if that's the case and be adept at looking because you'll start seeing it as you're walking around and you, you'll see, okay. While you're doing this, you know, and you, you, you want to keep note of what, what some of these costs are going to be coming up. And uh, when it gets down to asking the seller for some legitimate discounts and some of this stuff, which we'll talk a little bit more in a little bit. And some of these properties, uh, such as the office, are going to have fire and life safety panels. And um, this is a very expensive um uh, retrofit if you have to put in new fire life safety panels per code uh this can be an expensive item these these uh, get very expensive and if it's not up to code you want to find out when was the last inspected can you get a copy of the report uh you know are parts still readily available check um to see if there's a, a new compliance for more updated uh, uh, panels that are uh, that have to be put in sprinkler uh, retrofits as well some of the municipalities are requiring properties to uh, be retrofitted with sprinklers which can get expensive and you want to know what that time frame is you want to put it into your financial analysis if, if you have to do it and um, you want to go down to the local municipal building department and ask them, hey, are there any violations? Uh, are there any upcoming um, code compliance issues that the property's gonna have to comply with that I should know about? And uh, sometimes you'll be surprised. It'll, they'll tell you, yeah, we have this or that, or uh, here's what's going on. Um, yeah, there is a code violation that we're still waiting to uh, get the compliance uh, certificate on. So you want to know about these things. Anything going on in the area that we should know about? Um, you know, highway e expansions or things that are going to affect the property. Property documents. Okay, this is, this is one that can easily be overlooked when you're purchasing a property. We talked a little bit about asking for the building plans. Building plans can save you a lot of time and headaches and uh, if they're tenant build outs that you want to make sure you get the plans on the tenant improvement work any of the mechanical stuff that's been done um, any letters of credits warranties that are going to be transferred over I've got in the book uh, uh, a due diligence list and a due diligence document checklist that you can use to go through these things. But what ends up happening is a lot of investors will just forget to ask, you know, they, and then afterwards they'll call up the seller and say, Hey, I, you know, I forgot to ask you, do you have those, the building plans for the building? No, we, or I, I've even heard him say, Oh, we don't, 
we threw them out. We don't own the building anymore. Like, oh my gosh. Sometimes you can go down to the city and they'll have a copy. But I've also seen people that went down the city and they go, no, we don't have them. So make sure you ask for this stuff. If they're the bigger buildings, they have operation manuals. They have all the security codes to um, access the systems. And uh, so you, you really want to make sure you're asking for this stuff while you're while you're in escrow. Like we just talked about these things here. Uh, equipment manuals, maintenance records, really important. I mean, these are things that you don't think about until you need them. And then it's like, oh no, we don't have that. We never got that from them. You know, then it's like, oh, you wish you had. Talking about ground leases here a little bit, only because, not that we do a lot of them, but should you get involved with one, you wanna make sure you've got ample time to um, get everything, or do all the due diligence you need to do. And don't, here's something that people forget about when you're doing ground leases. You've got a disinterested third party that's getting a, a ground lease payments, right? And uh, they don't really care, but the, the lender's going to want an estoppel from the ground lessor. And sometimes these are from 20, 30 years ago. The original developer and his partner are long gone. They got a bunch of heirs that have it. And now you're going after 15, 20, 25 people that need to sign a estoppel certificate. Let me tell you, I've been in that scenario before. It's maddening because some of these people haven't talked to each other in 20 years and, you know, trying to track them down and it's, it's crazy. So whatever you think you need time wise, you know, you say, Oh, we can, you only need 30 or 45 days. No, I want 90 days or 60 with the ability to extend out 30 in case we need it to get more signatures and all this other stuff taken care of. So just make sure you're aware of that. I just, I see people get backed into a corner doing these things and it's like, whoa. So let's talk a little bit about this underwriting and financial analysis. I, you know, I've been bringing it up periodically, but you should be, as you're going through your due diligence, uh, tweaking your financial analysis of it as you're collecting information and, and vetting it out. Because as I always say, uh, you, the, very rarely is a property worth the same at the time you sign the agreement than it is at the end of your due diligence period. That's because you've had the time to go through and, and collect all the information on the property that you need to collect to really get the true value of it. You know, I, I always like to emphasize that, you know, you, you make your money on the buy, you realize the value on the sale, right? So if you're not on top of this stuff and you own it, and it's like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known how much I would have had to come up with. I've seen people have to go back to the lenders or the investors and say, you know what? I didn't realize that it was going to cost this much on the <clears throat> fixing this up or redoing this space or whatever the common areas. And then what happens is they they'll go down to the city and they go, Oh, you have to comply with all the new codes for ADA and all that stuff. So you have to redo all of those things. Well, they weren't counting on doing all the bathrooms or what have you. So now they're looking at another 40, $50,000 that they didn't have plugged into their budget. So let me tell you something, your investors aren't too happy with you. When you go back to them and you've got a cash call starting out, right? Or the lender says, what do you mean you don't have? Now all of a sudden they've got some new rules that they're uh, putting upon you that you weren't hoping, you were hoping not to have to comply with, right? So anyway, very important. Just remember whether it's you, your client, whatever the case may be, you're constantly updating your underwriting and your financial analysis. So by the time you get to the end of the due diligence period, you've got a pretty good idea of what you're looking at from uh, cash disbursement. And not only that, if you're gonna go back and you're gonna ask the seller for a discount on the pricing, okay, you better have a legitimate reason to go back. You don't just go back and say, hey, you know, I went through my due diligence and there's 
I'm going to need 150 grand off this property. Why? Well, because I need a bunch of stuff. Yeah, like what? Well, just stuff, a bunch of stuff, mechanical. Fit. They don't want, believe me, sellers don't want to hear that. But if you go back and you have a, a very uh, itemized uh, list of, of items that need to be taken care of and the, the cost associated with it, they're a little bit more open-minded about it and doesn't mean they have to be happy about it, but as long as they're legitimate, and I'm not saying you're gonna get your full amount every time, but it opens the negotiation and I've gotten much more than I even thought I was gonna be able to get once I was able to you know, go through it with them methodically and uh be able to explain to them hey you know th these are these are numbers that i was not counting on when i made the original offer and and now this is not making economic sense based on this i've canceled deals only to have them come back you know a few months later hey we were in escrow with somebody else and they had the same issues you're more qualified we want to sell it to you not at that price i don't want to buy it now the embers have cooled <laughs> I need another price, you know, so, or whatever the case may be, you know, it just, but many times it's been like that. Sometimes they never come back, but hey, if it doesn't make economic sense, I'm okay with that, right? I never fall in love with the real estate. That's a real estate 101. Don't do that, you know. Property appraisals. Here's where I see a lot of people just, they cross their fingers and um, it's like, uh, that, I don't know if that was a question or not, but um, yeah, it wasn't. Okay. So property appraisal, this is what I tell people. Be very proactive with it. Now, let me just say as an additional comment to this. Now, more than ever, you better be proactive with it. Why? Because let me just tell you something. All the years I've been doing this, Appraisers, they get very gun shy. Okay, they've been—they are the famous whipping boys and girls of the of the business, right? The lenders like to point to them. You appraised it at that number, you know, whatever. Right? Well, let me tell you something. This is when they get ultra conservative, right? So you're going to have to go in, and what I usually will do is I will tell the lender, you know, I want to, I want to talk to the appraiser. A lot of times I say, well, you know, it's, I want to talk to them because there's things they need to know about, about the property. Okay, fine. Usually they want to make the loan. So they're usually going along with it. So you want to get them the updated rent roll. You want to tell them about any uh, proposals, lease proposals that, um, you know, may be on the table and you're talking about that they, they want to, you want, want them to take that under consideration. Recent sale and lease comps in the area that they may not know about that are so recent that it may not be in the records. Um, any cost cutting measures you're going to implement, uh, any additional income you're going to uh, be able to generate and derive from the property once you implement these uh, things that you want to implement. Anything that's going on in the area that would justify and um, shore up um, your comments about areas improving. Here's what's going on. There's a new thing going on over here. This is happening. This is the trend over there. This is becoming a very trendy area for that. And this is a new project that's going to be built over here in the next 12 to 18 months. You go to them with all this information, guess what? They're, they're thrilled. Why? Because you're doing a bunch of their homework for them. I've never had them say to me, to me no, I don't want your information. You know, no, they're like, usually, thank you very much, right? Uh, I've had them, I've shown up at uh, the uh, walkthroughs with them and handed them a notebook full of stuff. And I'd say, look, this is all the information I have here. Can we take a few minutes to go through it real quick so you see what I'm talking about? Most of them will say, sure, that'd be great. You go through, you talk them through it, they see it, great, thanks so much. Then I follow up again. I don't leave it on autopilot. 
you have to be on fighter pilot, okay? Because what'll happen is if they don't have all this information and they're just going by comps that are in the, you know, co-star or wherever they're going into to get them. And then uh, the lender gets it and they go, hey, you know what? We told you we could lend X, but no, now we can only lend Y. Wait a minute, you know, why is that, all right? So you wanna be able to, and here's the other thing, now that you tell the lender about everything that's going on, they're saying, now I see what you're saying. You know what, uh, we're gonna go back to the appraiser and get him to make it a higher number. Well, sometimes that's not an easy thing, right? So I say, be very proactive. If you are, I promise it works out more times in your favor than not. It really does. And they love it when you're providing information that makes their job easier. So you want to assume nothing, okay? If, it's, if you're assuming anything, there's, you have to assume there's a bunch of problems. But here's what I would say about the closing statement. The closing statement is where I see a lot of investors leave big money on the table. And I understand why, because they're exhausted. They're usually doing this not as their regular you know, uh, business. They're doing it as their side gig that they do when they invest and they're doing it you know, in between doing their work. And they've got all these things coming at them like the inspections and the uh, reviewing all the information, tenant interviews, appraisals, loan applications. They're just, they're, they're besieged by information. So what happens is um, they're drained. By the time they get to a closing statement, all they want is this thing to be over with and closed. Well, this is just the time you need to be tapping the brakes and say, wait a second, let's take a close look at this settlement statement to see what's on here. And what happens is there's some sellers that are very adept at loading up their credits. And you need to go through them, scrutinize them, question them. Where's the backup on this? You're, you know, no, I'm not paying for these association fees that you paid for. I'm not doing that. If there's, there's, if there's any, uh, termination fees and the service agreements, you need to pay those. I'm not picking those up. I want 30 day cancellation on everything. So I have the ability to go rebid, right? And uh, you'd be surprised what you'll find on there. Well, I told you a couple of stories on it, but uh, you really, really wanna be looking at this carefully. And I always suggest if you have somebody that you know that's adept and knows what they're looking for on it. This could be your accountant if they're real estate savvy. It could be a property manager you know, asset manager, even real estate attorneys will know. Then you have them look at it and say, do you see anything on here? You know, one of the ones I am always seeing is I'll, I'll look and I'll see uh, lender legal review, you know, $6,000, $7,000 for what? To look at the te the leases, come on, that's a lot of money. Let's eliminate that or at least discount it. You know, I need to cut it in half. I'll start with that. <laughs> you know, and you'd be surprised how many. Okay, fine. You know, let's just do it. So, uh, um, really, really uh, important. You know, and if there's the other thing I didn't touch on here is if there's inventories that come with the properties, that could be air filters, lighting supplies, uh, you know, uh, spare parts, uh, all sorts of things that you'll see, depending upon the size of the building, some of them are actually quite um, uh, extensive. Rooms full of, you know, air filters and lighting and stuff that adds up to sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. I, I, I bought a property where they took a $50,000 air conditioning condenser that was a spare part out of there. And I said, wait a second, because I always take, I, I try to get it all in the, in the uh, purchase and sale agreement, but if it's not in there, I, you know, I'll, I'll take a picture of their building engineer's office or storeroom and make sure you have a picture of all the spare parts and everything. Then you go there but prior to the end of the due diligence period, you know, four or five days or whatever it is before and say, Hey, you know, what happened to all these, 
spare parts that were in here. I need them all put back or I'm going to get a credit. And I sent them off the photo of the storeroom, you know. And most of the time they want to get the deal done, so they just put it all back. But it could be, you know, if it's a retail center, maybe it's seasonal decorations or, or something like that, right? Those can add up. And there's all sorts of different things. So you want to make sure that you're watching it after all this stuff. Because if you're not, they're, they're not going to be warning you, hey, did you check this out? No, they're hoping you're just going to get it closed and move on. And it's no longer their problem, you know. So uh, make sure that when you get to this point, you're at the closing statement, slow down. Take a look at it, scrutinize it. Make sure that you're comfortable with every single item that's on there, that it's not a debit to you and a credit to the seller. So get this stuff right, which is like anything else, like riding a bike. The more you do it, the better you get at it, it starts coming natural to you. Each property is different. Each Seller's different, so you're going to learn from each one. But it, I always say it, it, it's you, you can have major setbacks by not doing this properly. And maybe you're buying a building, maybe you shouldn't be buying. Uh, never should take, be taken lately. And we already talked about scrutinizing. And I already talked to you about assume nothing. That's where you get into trouble. That's where I see people get into a lot of trouble. But they were such nice people. I didn't think they were that, you know. You know, it's the old trust but verify, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, like I said, if you assume any uh, thing, you assume there's problems waiting to be discovered. Because there is. I, I bought buildings that were, you know, two years old that had problems. You know, so you just, you just have to make sure that you're paying attention. So uh, the handbook uh, that I have out there on Amazon, um, it's got the due diligence checklist in there. It's got a due diligence document checklist in there. And it's got a sample tenant questionnaire, which I use to send to tenants. Obviously, you'll have to modify it for whatever type of property it is, right? But um, questions are similar. And I send it off usually a few days before the interview and say, Here, here's an idea of what the kind of questions I'll be asking. I've had tenants like hand me this questionnaire all filled out when I walk in the door and I go, well, thanks, but I was really hoping to just ask you these questions, but that's, thank you for doing it. And then, um, and then the sample lease abstract form that's in there as well. But um, I will tell you that this is not a book that you'll read and you'll put back up on the shelf and said, okay, I had some, information in there you'll pull it out every single time that you're going to do an acquisition and i the reason i say that is i still do it's still my reference manual there's too many things to remember remember we need reminding as much as we need learning just like a uh, pilot who's flown tens of thousands of hours still does a checklist pre pre-flight checklist before they take off that's what this is because you'll forget. I mean, I when I'm doing an acquisition, I actually listen to my audio, which is hard to listen to your own voice so many times, but it remind, jogs my memory as, to, oh yeah, I gotta ask that question. Forgot to ask that, it's important, you know. So uh, do yourself a favor, it's a reference book. You'll use it over and over again, and uh, you'll be glad you have it. It'll be, become one of your best friends when you're buying a property. And that's it. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about a course, if, if you don't mind. I got a due diligence video course. Um, what happened is uh, during the course of my uh, getting the book out there, I kept getting, uh, and I was doing seminars, I was uh, getting requests for a video course. Hey, do you have a video course certification program? Or something? And I kept saying, no, I got I to gotta do one of those. I really do. So I finally put one together, and in it there's a, um, you can take the quiz, final exam, which you got to get 70% or better, but 
you get a certificate of completion and a digital badge that you can put on your LinkedIn account if you so desire or whatever professional accounts you, you want a designation on. And um, in it, it has 16 modules where I go through the various uh, aspects of due diligence. I have uh, action item list, I have glossary, I have uh, glossary terms, I have uh, uh, study notes. So by the time you get through this thing, you are, it's pretty embedded in your DNA. And I always tell people, look, once you get the course, I always highly recommend you go through it, you know, every few months, at least for a couple of three times. Because if you do, it's gonna, you're gonna really get it inside your, your uh, DNA, like I said, and you'll be glad you did. And there's a few different options on there that you'll see. You have to go to uh, courses.impactcoachingsystems.com. That's courses.impactcoachingsystems.com. And there you'll find the courses. I've got a few different uh, menu items there that you can pick from. And if you, uh, the basic and the silver, if you put in uh, DDHB20, you can get a 20% a discount on your course. So with that, that's DD, D is, D is in due diligence, HB is in handbook, two zero. So with that, uh, I would say, Raphael, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, to uh, answer any. And basically anybody that does have any questions, feel free to email me or feel free to call me uh, if you got any questions and uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, uh, help in any way with that, in that respect. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of information for sure. Uh, I know when I first read the book, I was, I mean, it's just a ton of information. It applies to both. I mean, I know not everyone here invests primarily in commercial, but it also applies to any type of asset you're looking to purchase. I mean, just being very diligent about how you interact with that property before you actually purchase it will save you a ton of heartache. I mean, I mean, it could save you thousands and thousands of dollars just by being very diligent about it, like, like Brian was saying, just making sure that you got to cross all your T's and dot all your I's. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. You know, what I tell people, and what Raphael brings up a good point, no matter what you're doing, you know, by having and adhering to a uh, comprehensive system while conducting due diligence, you're going to do it faster, easier, more efficiently, and you're less likely to miss something. And that's really what you want. You don't, you don't want to uh, let things slip through the cracks, which is easy to do. And I know that because that's how I learned the hard way. It also has a 14-page due diligence checklist in the course that you can get. But I can uh, give you uh, a way to get it right now. If, if everybody has a smartphone, uh, you want to put it in, go into your text, and in where the phone number is, put in 415-212-9200. Five, seven. And then put in the word where the text is, put in checklist. It can just be lowercase. And then send that off. And what's going to happen is you're going to get a return text, going to ask you for your first name, and then the next, and your email address. Put it in the next one's going to say your email address. And then once you put that in, you're going to get sent a link of a PDF of the checklist. And the checklist is the best one I've come across. It's way more than any of us really can ever use because it's you can use it for development, any any kind of acquisition. It's really, really quite comprehensive. But once you have that, you're covered. So any anybody have any questions or comments or uh, it was a ton of information, but I mean, I, I think it was, I think it was awesome. Um, does anyone, yeah, like, like Brian was saying, does anyone have any questions? You can unmute them and just ask you whatever you want to do.
I don't have questions, but I thought it was a great, uh, great meeting. Thank you so much, Brian, for speaking. Oh, my yeah. pleasure. You know, one thing I, I forgot to tell you, which is the most important part of uh, commercial real estate investing to me, and I'll impart it to you as well, is if you're doing this with love and service, there's no way that you're going to do it wrong. And the reason I say that is because people pick up on that so, so quickly, especially in today's world. You know, I, I, I just tell people, if you're serving God by serving others and you're out there doing this with love and service, they see that you have their best interest in mind. They're much more open to working with you and helping you get to middle ground and what have you. So uh, I've seen it work again and again in my career. And I impart you with that information. If you take that to heart, I, I promise you, you will see it work as well and you'll never want to work differently. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for inviting me on and allowing me to uh, tell you a little bit about how due diligence works with this. And I welcome any questions or that you may have either via email or via phone. I'm happy to talk to you as well. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Really appreciate you stop, uh, stopping by and, and sharing some of your time. I know the time's valuable, so really do appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks, Brian. Great information. Great. Thank you. Bye now. You guys. Thanks.